use it for everything. How to use it for illuminating cuisine, how to use it for heating your coffee and how to use it for winning compost. Maybe the thing about the compo is a lie, but you will find out during this talk. Um, as the title implies, it's not just for global illumination, but it's for all kinds of lighting effects and we'll teach you how to implement it and how to use it. So first of all, if you've been to any of our previous uh, talks, you'll know this. We are Bero, who's sitting here, who has done all the actual work, who's done all the coding and has probably written every piece of code you can ever think of and is very awesome. And I'm just his voice for today. I'm Urs of Mercury and I will be presenting the slides he's made. So if you have any questions um, afterwards, address them to him, not to me, because I only, I'm only the one dancing around here. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to be talking about voxel cone tracing and as you can see, these are three words in the titles. It involves voxels, it involves tracing, and the thing we're tracing are cones. Um, what is it good for? Most of the time when look, talking about voxel cone tracing, people think of diffuse global illumination. So, in case you don't know, if you just render stuff in a classical forward way, you render a triangle on the screen, you have to decide what colors does it get, and normally you just decide that based on whatever it is you're rendering, without any idea about the environment of it. So if you want to have more realistic looking lighting, if you want to have nice looking, physically looking scenes, you want to have the ability for objects to also reflect light onto other objects. So you need some sort of light transport from one thing to the other. That's called global illumination. And mostly when people think about global illumination, they think about diffuse lighting. So if you have a diffuse object, I don't know, maybe my jacket, it's black, so it's a bad example. It just gets light from all directions and then it's a bit, a little bit less black based on that. So that's what you can use it for. Um, but then also you can use it for stuff like specular lighting. So if you have a shiny item like a metallic item or glass or something like that, you have reflections that are not just blurry all around diffuse lighting, but very focused. You reflect something from the light source into your eye. And you can use voxel cone tracing for that as well. You can use it for reflections, you can use it for refractions, hard and soft shadows, and more or less all kinds of light effects that you might be interested in. Um, so you can use it for diffuse, you can use it for um, specular, and you can use it for any combination of the two. Yes. So what is it we do? The last uh, word in the title is tracing. So we're tracing something and most people uh, will probably think of ray tracing, which is, for example, what most of the shader live coding shaders in the last couple of days did and what most people think of when they think of rendering with a pixel shader, for example. In ray tracing, every pixel of your scene sends a ray, a straight line, into your scene and then it terminates somewhere hitting an object and that color then gets used and more advanced stuff can happen. Um, but that's not what we're doing. What we are doing is cone tracing. So for every pixel of our image, we send out a cone, so a three-dimensional conical object that does not just hit one point, but it might hit a little bit of this and a little bit of this and most of that, and then part of it also misses. Um, so we do not have something that's a local 1D line, but something that actually has a volume. And as we are tracing this, this, this cone, we start near or the pixel or the, the starting point where we are. And that means that our cone in the beginning is pretty small, covers a pretty small volume. And then as we continue, it gets larger and the, the area it covers gets larger and larger and larger. If you, are, if you have used ray marching, the typical distance field ray marching, or if you are at least have an idea about it, you will probably have seen diagrams that look very similar to this, but this is actually not the same thing we're doing. In distance field ray marching, these circles always represent the distance to the nearest object. Doesn't matter here. The important part when ray, uh, tracing through a cone is that in this beginning area, we want to somehow look at small features and small areas, and the further we go, the less interested we are in small features, and the more we are in big features. And that is where the third word in the title comes in, voxel. So one way to represent what there is in the scene is a voxel grid. Instead of having a 2D grid of pixels, you have a 3D grid of voxels. And if you 
do a very nice high resolution voxel grid, you have very fine spatial information about where your stuff is. And so, for example, if you start your array, you have very small start your cone, you have a very small area, so you're interested in small features, so you look at your, your voxel grid. But then as you propagate through your cone, your, the area gets larger and larger, and if you only have this, this very small fine grid, it would be less and less practical because you'd have to search in the environment, am I hitting something here, am I hitting something here? And up there, you, what you really want is a really coarse grid, just to know is there something in this area. And Luckily, the texture units in GPUs gives us a very nice feature um, that helps us with this because we can just store a voxel uh, in a mip-mapped 3D texture. So first we, we build a, a voxel grid and there will be slides about how we do this in detail on a very high resolution and then we let the GPU, or actually we, we do it by hand, but we build a mip-map tree and so as we trace through this cone, we look into increasingly coarse voxels to know how much of the cone is actually hitting something. So we have, for every uh, voxel, we know how much there is. And also, in the same voxel structure, we store how much light gets transported from where to where. All right. So what is voxel cone tracing in written words? It's a kind of volume ray marching, or ray casting, based on the idea that we're tracing cones. It starts with some some start bias, so cone starts a little bit away from the distance with some size, and further steps get larger and larger and cover larger and larger areas. In the beginning, when you're looking at very small features, you also want to do small steps, but then as your cone gets wider, you less and less care and you do larger and larger steps. At each step running through your cone, you look up what is the radiance, so what is the amount of light that this ray is collecting, and what is the occlusion in ray tracing, when you're doing just a thin line, you can say I'm either flying in free, free space or I'm hitting an object and my ray is done. But here, since we have this cone that hits, parts of it hit, part of it don't, you have to uh, integrate your occlusion. You might hit a little bit of an object and then continue onwards and then you hit more of an object and continue onwards and eventually decide when you want to terminate your ray, either because it's far enough or because it hits enough stuff. So that's the, the condition how far we want to go. And then it's a cone tracing, as I explained before. We, we go to coarser and coarser MIP levels as we walk along. All right. So it's a bit like ray tracing into a simplified scene. Since your scene may look very fancy and have polygon structures of, of any form, but what we are actually tracing into here is a voxel representation. So basically here you take whatever you've built in your scene and you represent it as a Minecraft world because you have only voxel blocks. Um, so it's not as precise as actually doing ray tracing into the actual scene. There are possibilities to do global illumination and all the things which, uh, which I explained here using, for example, path tracing which does the same without the voxel acceleration and just basically Monte Carlos by throwing lots of rays around and gives you the same features. But in path tracing you have the issue of noise because you can never throw as many rays as you want. Voxel cone tracing doesn't have this problem. You have the ability to have fractional intersection, so you only occlude a little bit or less little bit. Also in path tracing your rays hit something, they are occluded. And you have a level of detail control. You can choose what resolution of your voxel grid you will like. So you can trade off quality versus speed. And normally you will find something that you like um, and that works well for you. At the end, however, it's only an approximation and it's not really the precise lightning thing. Many things work really well, but sometimes light leaking can occur. Um, if you, for example, think of you have very finely grained structures and you put them in a voxel grid and suddenly they become blocks that touch on corners, there might be possibilities that light leaks to these corners. Um, in uh, these cases you have to make sure A, you have lots of parameters that you can tweak, so that can uh, help you get rid of that. And in cases where this doesn't help, you might have to make sure that your scene descriptions contains some geometry, some non-visible geometry, just to feed into the voxel structure to make sure in these places that the light doesn't leak. But it's oftentimes possible. 
Okay, um, so if you were in the 64k compo yesterday and weren't completely drunk, you uh, probably took note of Barrow's entry, which was exactly using this technique to do this awesome trance uh, uh, demo where lots of indirect lighting was happening and it was all polygon rendered so even though it might have looked like a sort of ray tracing solution or some sort of uh, distance function thing it was not all of this all of what you were seeing were polygons and they were using voxel cone tracing and then it looked like that so the way it was implemented in the 64k yesterday the first choice you have to do where do you put your voxel grid um, in this demo, since it was all relatively small spaces, the voxel grid is situated in real-world space. So it's just situated fixed in the scene. Alternatively, you can hang it onto the camera first room and move it along, which has the advantage that you don't need to resolve things that you're not looking at anyway. has the disadvantage that if you move the camera around, you might have problems with the voxelization moving back and forth. And there are also ways to deal with that. Um, and the algorithm works as such that first, everything gets reset from the previous step. Then the triangles, or the triangles that should be rendered on screen, get rendered with a dummy pixel shader. So the actual pixels get discarded, but all the, all the information, all the vertex transformation and all of that gets recorded in a buffer to be reused in the next couple of steps. Once this is recorded, the voxel data is being built from this. Um, so first, the first bounce of light transport gets computed by rasterizing the stored triangle information into this 3D voxel grid, and then light being propagated and MIP maps being built from that. This is being reset, and this is being done a second time. So the triangles are still stored; they're still in the same location in the space, since it's the still frame, it's the same frame still being rendered, and once again. They are being rasterized, but now they have the updated information from before, and the next level of light transport happens. It gets propagated, gets been mapped, and then we have a complete voxel grid that contains the two bounce lighting information for the scene. And then we render the recorded triangles again, and this time we shade them onto the screen. And in the shading, we look up into the, uh, as, as shown before, into our voxel structure, uh, what the lighting for every pixel is, and then we do some fancy things to make it look good. What kind of data structures does this need? Well, obviously, we need the, the 3D voxel grids. And in this two-bounce process, we need at least two for these. Um, in, the, in the 64K that you saw yesterday, this was a 128-cubed grid. Um, in every of these voxel cells, you have seven color targets. So um, seven different RGBA targets. In this case, it was 16-bit floating point numbers, since it's always very nice for light transport to have the ability to do HDR and to, to have, well, light values above one with the MIP maps for the data structure. Of course, you need one for the first bounce, then one to transport for the second bounce. If you want to do more bounces than two, if you just want to render geometry, you probably don't want that because people will not look at the second more than the second bounce, but if you do glass in front of a mirror and you have reflections and refractions, then you may want to do this. You will not need a third buffer because you can then just use two of them and ping pong them back and forth. And then an additional buffer you, uh, that is required is the volume front view, which is actually just a dummy because if you remember, the first rendering pass takes the triangles and stores them into, into a list and it needs to render to some target um, and it makes sense to have it the same cross-sectional size as the 3D thing, so that from the coordinates that it gets mapped to, you have um, some additional information. But then you do not need the pixels. You can use whatever. You can use the smallest possible pixel format that you can get and then discard it anyway. And finally, um, you need the buffers. In this case, these are uh, shader storage buffer objects where the information for the triangles and where they belong into the uh, voxels get stored. So let's look into detail at all the steps. First one, relatively straightforward. You have um, some counters that get reset and some, some the triangle link list which will be used in between gets reset. So that's not the difficult part. The first step is now, we're going back to the list. You have triangles, you want to render them on the screen and first thing you want to do is you map them into your voxel grid. 
So what you do is you take your triangle geometry as you would normally render it on the screen and you process it with a normal vertex shader so that you get your coordinates in, in world space. Then you have a geometry shader which gets these three vertices for every triangle that gets, that gets processed um, and it gets stored into these SSBO buffers. Stuff like the material that this triangle has, the positions, the normals, texture coordinates and whatever else you might need, emissive colors, all that gets stored. And then there's a pixel shader which basically does nothing. And in order to have this fast, you want to disable everything you can. It should not write depth, it should not look up depth, no stencil buffers, no everything. And it writes into probably an 8-bit grayscale uh, render buffer so that it writes as little as possible. It's unfortunately not possible to not write anywhere in OpenGL. So you have to have this buffer and then you just discard it. So use the shittiest buffer you can. And now we have the triangular information completely, completely processed and it's stored in this SSBO. And now we can voxelize it. This is a render pass that runs for every voxel. Um, ah, uh, the, the, the first place, uh, the, the, the first pass runs on each of these buffer triangles. So the vertex shader fetches the triangle data from the, the SSBO that was stored before. Um, the geometry shader does a rasterization, a conservative rasterization. And what this means is if you have a triangle that covers a number of voxels, all of these get, get tagged as this is where it touches. But especially if it's only a little bit of a corner poking into one voxel, that one is definitely stored. So we want to make sure that we do not miss a triangle poking into a voxel. So this is conservative. Um, NVIDIA and Intel provide hardware acceleration for this, but uh, ATI doesn't, or at least not so far. So there's this geometry shader that does this as a fallback. Um, next step then, the pixel shader, which maps onto this, this voxel uh, grid. It looks at this conservative triangle data that comes from either the geometry shader before or the hardware acceleration and double checks that it actually intersects because there are some false positives now and then. They will be eliminated and then um, every triangle that touches a voxel goes into this voxel's linked triangle list. So it's a linked list for every voxel which triangles touch it. And then it's the second pass that iterates through this. So the second pass runs for each voxel it needs the, the vertex shader layer enabled so that it runs on the 3D voxel grid. So for each of the 3D voxel uh, cells, this shader runs. The pixel shader goes through all the triangles that touch this vertex and appropriately, uh, uh, appropriately sums up the color values for the corresponding triangles. So it just runs through this and it as yet doesn't have any information from a previous bounce. This is the first bounce we have the color or the emissiveness of all of our incoming triangles, they get summed up, and then we have the incoming light in each voxel. Next step uh, now is to get this propagated, to get the light actually transported. Um, again, this runs for each of the, the voxels, and it does a anisotropic light transport, and this is, this will be explained, I think, two slides down, why we need the seven different color targets for each of the voxels and how the anisotropic light transport happens. Um, and after that, it MIP maps it down to the, to the lower MIP map levels so that at the end, we have the, the, the tree structure that we need. Um, this is, since it is anyway in the right place of the pipeline being done by hand here, I guess it could be using the, the hardware itself, but it hasn't turned out to be necessary so far. Ah, this is the slide. If you're thinking about, you have a voxel grid which just has one color target, and you were doing something like a geometry where you have a plane with one green side and one red side, you voxelize that, you get incoming light, green on one row, red on the other row, and then you want to build your MIP map stage from that, what will happen is that the colors mix totally and at the end you'll have brown mush. So this, because in total between this green and this red you get a brownish color. 
And that doesn't do you very much good because what you actually want is directional light information in every voxel. So what instead you do is each voxel contains for your six directions, one RGBA buffer, which tells you how much light gets transported from there. And an additional seventh one, which contains the occlusion information. So incoming into your, into your buffer through the rasterization is how much of that voxel is actually filled. And then in the mid-map process, the, this occlusion value just gets isotropically filtered, but the light that gets transported retains its directional information by making sure that they are just appropriately blurred this way. So this is how it works. You do the directional volume integration, you add them up, and you get the re uh, result for each of the directions. And then you transport them up the MIP hierarchy. So with an isotropic voxel, you just get the value. This is what you want for the occlusion. And for the anisotropic process, which is what you want for the color, you then get your anisotropic light transport information. OK, once we have that, and once we have the pro completely propagated first bounce light transport in the scene, we reset our counters, we reset our linked lists and our process voxels. And we do basically the same thing again, identically. We again fetch the data from our triangles. We again um, build the linked lists and uh, do the, the same process as before on, on with the geometry shader if necessary. But then the second time, we now have the light information from the first bounce already arrived. So we can now use this to transport it out again. And we have the second bounce transported. And then, in the end, we do again the same anisotropic transport, and we have the light information after the second bounce in the second buffer completely laid out in our voxel structure. But as so far, we have not drawn anything onto the screen at all. This is what comes next. Now we want to render our recorded triangles. Now we want to actually go rendering onto the screen. So um, we have okay already recorded what the, what the triangle information is, so we know where they will be going on the screen. We just read it from the array. So the, the vertex shader doesn't need to do much since it just fetches this data again. And then there's an almost normal pixel shader. You know, you have a triangle, you know, shade it on screen, and you want to know what the lighting information for this one is. And now we start the actual contracting. Because if you now want to do, for example, diffuse lighting onto, let's say you have a plain surface with a normal like this, and you want to know what is the diffuse light contribution from all directions, you pack some cones with appropriate opening angles around it. You can do this in some different configurations, but it turns out quite well to have one in the polar axis and then some arranged around. You can probably vary this, how many of these you want, and what opening angles you want for those. And if you sum these up, you get a nice, more, very good approximation for the, the, spherical, the spherical BRDF that is the diffuse cone. So this is what gives you diffuse um, global illumination. But if you want something like uh, uh, specular refraction, so you want metallic stuff reflecting, you have your incoming view direction, you have your normal, and then you just build a small cone around this. And in this cone, you now start looking at the uh, high resolution voxel data. You start to accumulate and you go to coarser and coarser levels until you be m sufficiently occluded. And that gives you the inf information for your specular thing. And then if you combine the two, you can this way build a BRDF any way you like. Of course, there is a limit to how many of these cones you can trace before it gets too expensive. But in a setup like this, it can be done in real time, as you've seen yesterday. So you get a bunch, I think it is eight or so cones around for your, for your diffuse uh, contribution, and you get one additional cone for your, for your specular contribution. And there you are, you have a combination of diffuse and specular light. One question that then goes into it is, what should be your cone size for your specular light? Um, you, if, you, if you think about, uh, you have a roughness parameter, probably from your materials. Completely diffuse would be 180 degrees that we've done. Um, 
what is a good cone size given a certain roughness? And that is something that a lot of people have thought about and a lot of people have built different formulas for. Um, in real life, if you have roughness, you have some distribution of your surface normal that's not resolved, and you can, you can plot the distribution of how that is. But now we do not have a distribution. We just want one angle that is representative for the size. Um, in the 64K that was used yesterday, uh, that, that was shown yesterday, this formula has been used. And as you look, see by these equations, you have no way of understanding what it does. It has probably been empirically me measured. And there are different options, and I recommend you just try out which one fits well with otherwise your lighting model or what you, what you expect your roughness parameter to do. So these slides will be online later, so you can just steal it from here and try it and hopefully give some, uh, give some mention to Barrow if you do. Once you uh, have that and once you have your, your cones set up, they, they trace of course into the scene and some of them will terminate in geometry that is not really illuminated. So if you have your single light source here, you, this one will probably have one bounce contribution from there, but it's mostly dark. And this ray will terminate completely, so it will give you a perfect shadow. It will basically not give you any light contribution. And here there will be a specular shadow. But if this point, for example, traces towards the light, the, the cone will intersect this geometry a little bit, but not fully, so the, there's no reason to stop the ray here yet because it has maybe, well, I don't know, 10, 20% occlusion, and then you just continue to the light source. So you do not have to do anything else, and you automatically get soft shadows. Soft shadows just work because your cones are only fractionally intersecting. Yeah, now uh, Bero has put a large bunch of the code, especially of the tricky parts, into the slide deck. And we are now not going to explain all of this in detail, but it is in the slide deck so that you can look it up if you want to implement that yourself. There's a lot of, some of this are uh, toolkit code, like how do you transform your coordinate systems? Then there are things like how do you um, build rotation matrices for setting your cones in the proper direction? Um, here is the actual implementation of tracing the cones. Um, ah. So here you have a, 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 a marching loop that marches until either the maximum distance is reached or the, the, um, the occlusion exceeds a certain value that you can choose. And basically all it does is it gets a voxel for the, uh, for the place of the, approximate, uh, uh, of the uh, appropriate um, MIP level and then accumulates that and wa walks onwards based on the size of the cone where you are. So this is really not a lot of code to do the actual tracing and this is just a bunch of texture lookups. If you're used to writing really complex distance functions, you'll find that this is actually cheaper. Um, so you can do a couple of them in a couple of directions. If, if you really want to look at all the details, I recommend you download the slides afterwards, um, because, well, it's, it's code, you know. It works better if you paste it somewhere and run it. Um, here we have then uh, the e explicit shadow cone tracing. If you want to explicitly have a shadow cone, you just walk towards your light source. It can be an area light that determines your, your opening angle. And it's basically the same process again. You have a while loop and you do a texture lookup and that gives you the, uh, the shadow value. You just look at the, the isotropic shadow value here. Um, here we've got the same for the cone directions. So this is for the diffuse cone, what I showed, where you have the entire hemisphere. Um, the, the cone directions here are just this hard-coded setup that you saw on the slide that's being rotated appropri appropriately to be around the normal. And then the same voxel, uh, trace voxel cone function from before gets called to give you the diffuse contribution. And here you have the same for the specular light. I mean, uh, you calculate your specular direction, you get your uh, size of your, your cone from the function we've had before, and then you run this trace voxel cone function. 
And down here is the refractive light. If you want refraction, you can also just hit your surface and continue in the refracted direction. This is not any different than refraction and refraction from uh, any other way you might, would be doing it. Um, here you have uh, the functions for fetching voxels and doing the proper mid map uh, lookup because you have your seven different samples. Um, these depend, I think, on the direction. Is that right? Ah, uh, so these are these are basically actually basically helper functions for the stuff that happens on the next slide, where the pre-integration, so the actual filling of the voxel um, data structure happens. Uh, because now you have your different contributions from your different directions being summed up for all of your six directions. So you have plus x, plus y, plus z, min minus x, minus y, minus z, and um, this is the kind of code where you'll be debugging for two afternoons because you have a single number wrong somewhere. So it's, it's good to have a reference. Um, yeah, th so there are different uh, possibilities to set up your diffuse cone. I mean, the, the picture that was on the slide earlier was the one that had been in the code here. And you can alternatively, um, well, you can have more smaller ones, or you can have one really huge one, which is probably not a very good approximation, but yeah, so you can use 16, depending on uh, how much fidelity in your diffuse light you want. More cones, of course, mean more expensive, but also probably higher quality. Right, um, you've seen the 64K from yesterday, so we thought we'd not just show that again, because that's a bit boring. Instead, we have now launched the March Fabric, which is his very own demo tool. And there is an example scene in here that uses this. Since yesterday's 64K, based on it being a 64K, only had relatively simple gem generated geometry, this one is now a huge, very fancy mesh, reminiscent somewhat of the cocoon demos, I would say. Um, and you see you have the uh, reflecting spheres around and the light source somewhere back here. And um, you can now look at the fidelity of the uh, specular reflections that you're getting. And you see that um, the, the specular reflections on these more metallic, more reflective parts really look quite good. And I would say don't have to hide from path tracing approaches or actual ray tracing approaches. At least if you manage to choose your geometry and your, your specularity in such a way that it's it's all a bit disturbed, then you will never notice the artifacts and it actually produces quite wonderful results. So I think at the moment, this is now running, ah, um, I think th there's a second example, that's the path tracing of the same scene for comparison. Oh, it's a different scene. Okay, not, not the same scene. Just to compare the features, I mean, first of all, ah, this is very similar to what you saw in the demo yesterday. And this, as you see, is also real time and it also does global illumination by path tracing, but lacking any, any sort of, I mean, I think there's a little bit of temporal reprojection in there even, but it still doesn't, I mean, it still struggles very much with noise. Especially, you can see that most of the pixels everywhere are black, since most of the scene is black and you only hit light sources now and then. Ah, there is, there is some reprojection happening, so, so temporal blurring just to be able to get a little bit of uh, noise reduction in it. And if we switch back to the other one... Huh? Ah, uh, first he wants to show now a, an early implementation of the voxel cone tracing that is not as as tweaked out as the uh, the one yesterday in the demo. And you see, you have a nice Cornell box, and you have a well, you have a couple of occluders. You see that the shadows work really nicely. And I'm not sure which parameter he's now tuning. 
Ah, um, I think he now wants to show the acceleration data structure because um, the tool allows to directly show the voxel grid. He's now hiding, okay, hiding the geometry, and this is the information that is actually existing in the voxel grid. So you see, it's a it's a rough approximation of the geometry, and it has the light uh, transported in it. And um, I don't know, do you have animation? Can you let it run to see that it is actually done in real time? Okay, everybody believes you that it is in real time because yes, there's demo headed. Ah, uh, the, the light you're seeing right now here is the first bounce. And I guess you well, yeah, okay. Yep. So that's being shown here, and I guess we can now show the second bounce. Uh, ah, this is the first bounce. The other one was the second bounce, wasn't it? Yes, makes sense. So in the first bounce, you saw all the areas are more or less flat, and here you see that there is reflected light hitting, making this wall a little bit green and this one a little bit green, and so on. Uh, can you show some example where you change the resolution of the of the voxel grid? Ah, it's hard coded in many places, so not that easy to do. Okay, hmm, all right. So um, we've shown you what you can do. Uh, there's pro probably a lot of questions from your side. Uh, before there's questions, we I had some discussion with Bero earlier when we went through the slides, and there was especially the thing um, we have these seven RGBA render targets. Um, uh, where every voxel has its six directions and the seventh one giving the occlusion. But the occlusion is, of course, only a scalar value. And I asked, can you do something more advanced, like, for example, using a multiple expansion for your occlusion to get more fidelity and to, to have less chance of your leaking of your occlusion? And that is one possibility you can play with. You also have, if you don't care about the alpha channels, all the alpha channels plus these four values, so you can actually go to quite a high order of geometry representation and get rid of more, um, more problems. But anyway, now we'll have questions. If you have complicated questions, it's probably best to ask Barrow via RSC, but I can, uh, we can together answer easy questions, or maybe hard questions with easy answers. <laughs> There's somebody in the back. Oh, there's somebody here in the front. Or yeah, yeah, it's coming. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, what are the performance uh, limitations of this technique? So, how uh, complex can the uh, scene be where this technique can be used, mm -hmm. and can it be used with uh, interactive uh, applications such as games to a significant extent? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as you saw yesterday, um, the, the complexity of the scene that, that was in various demo was not a problem, uh, since it mostly, primarily the complexity of the, um, of the, uh, the computation complexity is limited by how large your, your voxel grid is, and then how often or how many cones you are using. Of course, you are feeding um, uh, you are feeding polygons into that, and if you have simply a fill rate issue, then you're blocked by that. Um, but fundamentally, Barrow just wrote me that uh, if you are using cascading shadow maps right now, instead of using your cascading shadow maps in view space, you can use the same thing uh, in, in view space, the voxel grid, and using a similar uh, strategy where you have different resolution levels in this direction, and it should what do you say? Should it be able to run in the same order of magnitude of time?
for, for this technique, you mean? Yeah, uh, so um, one uh, thing that you can use is uh, you run it at relatively ro low resolution, but you use temporary projection of your geometry to keep it real-time capable, but at the same time do not suffer from temporal artifacts. So that is something you can use. But do you have performance numbers for the implementation that you've used yourself? Ah, he'll, he'll run it um, in his demo tool with a profiler on, so you can actually look at numbers on a on this local laptop, so this is a GeForce MX150 in this machine. So you, it's, not, it's not a technique that's limited to high-end gaming rigs, but it is definitely something that can run on a not necessarily low-end, but a reasonable notebook. So now he's opening the actual, this is the actual 64K you saw yesterday. Okay, and what are the different lines we're seeing here? Are these the different render stages? Ah, the colors match these. So you see the two red lines are the first and the second bounce of the scene of this complexity. So you're in the order of, well, I would say 10 milliseconds after the second bounce. And then I guess the yellow line up there I guess the, the yellow line is actually then shading the triangles and doing the color tracing, right? Yeah, the yellow is the total sum of uh, uh, all these things down here. So the first shading pass, uh, the, the first um, bounce is relatively cheap, the second pass is a bit more expensive, and then the actual cone tracing is this weekly line here, and the yellow one is the sum of all of them. So. Of course, in the combo machine it was a lot more fluid, but this is something you can still probably work with on a machine like this. I mean, there's a reason why we, it, it is not something that we see in commercial games right now, because if you're focusing plat uh, hardware that people have, it's still not quite up to speed for performance, but it's something that is now available and that you can see is usable and I will say uh, is worth investigating. Are there any other questions? Yeah, ah. yeah I, ju I just have uh, additional information for the gentleman down here asking. It's actually implemented in the um, PlayStation 4 game called the Tomorrow Children. They wrote their entire rendering engine based on this. Uh, it's worth checking out gameplay videos. It looks amazing. It's a totally dynamic world where you can, like Minecraft, dig in the terrain and stuff like that. And it's all real-time shaded cool. using these techniques. Looks amazing. The Tomorrow Children, PlayStation 4. It probably helps if you have a voxel structure that you represents your worlds anyway. Uh, there's actually a Gamma Sutra article where they write about how they wrote the engine and the optimizations and stuff like that. It's worth checking out. Very informative. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was another question here in front. Thank you. Um, so, how do you uh, handle the case when, let's say I'm a pixel in a box and I'm starting just between voxels and um, when I hit the wall, I'm just between voxels. Uh, so I'm at uh, 0 0.5 occlusion. Um, how do I handle that case, basically? Uh, I'm not sure if I can explain better, but... Uh, so basi basically, you are cone tracing in a corner here? Yeah, and I'm walking to a wall, and my sample, I sample per voxel, but I sample just between two voxels. So when I hit the wall, I have an uh, occlusion value of uh, 0 0.5. Uh, so that's my end value when I've traced the ray. Mm -hmm. How do I handle that? Very well, do you have an answer for that? So what he is showing is the voxel grid from the demo. 
But how do you handle if your occlusion value end value is 0 0.5? What do you what do you do when you're just on the edge of yeah. of a solid voxel like yeah. this? If I hit the outer wall, uh, yeah. just between two voxels. Because I've seen people both scale by the final occlusion or doing like the occlusion matter more the further away you go. So the, the occlusion value and the color value is also multi-directional. I mean for the shadow it is, it is um, uh, isotropically propagated but it's still a multi-dimensional value. And only for the shadow, it's monodirectional. So if you hit an interface, you still, at this point, have a directional value of occlusion. And you can apparently work with that. Because you have your ray direction, you have a directional information about your occlusion at that voxel. When you hit the interface, you can work with that. Okay. I, I would recommend you... Uh, Contact Vero via yeah, RC and totally. ask for details because yeah. this is apparently something that's too complicated to show on the fly now. <laughs> Just having having seen the slides myself and not implemented it, it looks very nice and elegant solution, but I'm sure the devil is in the details. This seems to be one of the details. Okay, I think there seem to be no other simple questions or hard questions with simple answers. Ah, there's one. Um, have you tried using uh, sparse textures to keep the VRAM amount to minimum? Okay, Bebo seems to find something. I would guess that um, for the demo applications where you have a very local box, you can just use a full 128 uh, voxel grid, but if you are doing something that is more than that, if you're using more open scenes, Sparse textures are an idea. Have you have you considered that? Have you used that? Okay, no, no, not so far because the the application here was to have it in 64K and not bother with things that's not necessary. Um, but I, uh, it, it's of course a good idea. If your scene is mostly empty space, you don't need to store empty space. Um, however, you still need to have your light propagation information somewhere in there. So you probably have to have something that has adaptive uh, MIP level, so what your finest level is depending on where you are in space, so that you can still propagate across your non-represented sparse grids. And um, you're quickly going into data structure hell there. If you invent something great, you can probably make this very awesome, but I would guess that the complexity of it increases exponentially with how smart your, your data structure is. Um, I had a question. Uh, so if... Um uh, s since you have uh, all the information about uh, light transport in a voxel grid, uh, can you um, can you deal with things like, for instance, uh, volumetric smoke and so on, and like have basically uh, in your voxel some information about uh, how light can traverse it or not if it's still mostly free space? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so um, you can store all kinds of possible things into your voxels. If you, if you just want to do um, volumetrics, one thing you can do when you draw your triangle, you just, I mean, for now we've only been looking at how do you, how do you illuminate your surface um, and do the, the light extensions there. What you can also do when you draw your, your actual final pixels on screen, walk from the camera through the voxel grid to your surface and sum up volumetric information. You can also, of course, have something like particles that are flying in the scene, look up at their location in the voxel grid. What is the light environment they have? And you can use them as scattering centers. And there's definitely all kinds of awesome stuff you can do. I guess you could even have it interact with physics and have light sources pushing around stuff. I uh, think the possibilities are endless. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, he's saying that the path tracing implementation that he built 
also uses a voxel structure to, to I don't know, accelerate and store stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, there's one more question in front. Thank you. Um, so to capture the multiple bouncing, do you need to count trace while you are doing the second? No, no, cube? you're not. There's no cones involved in the light transport itself. You collect your triangles with all your light information into the voxel grid. You do this bidirectional, uh, uh, or what's it called, directional diffusion calculation to propagate it. Then you have the second pass, you do it again. You have the next pass, you do it again. And only once you draw the triangles on your screen and you want to decide for each uh, uh, fragment of your final triangle what is the light, then you voxel contrast into the voxel structure. And then you decide how many cones and what counts you need. So more, uh, I mean, you've seen in the, in the timing diagrams that the, uh, doing, doing these bounces takes about 10 milliseconds. You can probably not afford more than three of them, um, but yeah, so that scales up with the number of bounces. So I guess the hour is now basically full. Ah, short question in the back. Uh, the one question I have is that the triangle storage is basically done twice for the first bounce and mm -hmm. the second bounce. Why mm -hmm. is that? I mean, fundamentally, it's the same voxel grid, so I guess it can be the the um, link list could be reused there. But you're resetting it for some reason. Oh, that's just an implementation detail here, and you are completely right. Um, if you are building this voxel link list for each of the um, each of the cells, you could reuse that. Um, it's just in this case that it's the same shader running. I guess for 64K that makes it also a little bit smaller. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you want, you can store that. If it's the same voxel grid, you could of course also consider using a separate voxel grid and separate bounces. But if you're using the same, you could reuse this in this information and makes it possibly a bit faster. Yep. All right. I, I recommend all other questions. Bero is on IRC, Ilknet, Bero, and some group names. Uh, best come to the revision channel, you'll find him there. Um, and then you can go on his website, www. Maybe you show it on your, on, on your other machine so they can read it, www.rosso.net, where the slides will be uploaded, and you can, you can copy some code. And please credit him because he's doing awesome work. And um, there's also all kinds of other stuff from all the last year's seminars, um, presentations with hundreds of slides that I had to rush through. So I'm actually quite happy that this year it was a little bit more relaxed. And then um, keep enjoying revision, I would say. <laughs>